as, as John was introducing me, I just questioned the wisdom of having um, my first slide as a, a sick Hereford amongst the sea of, of um, healthy um, farmers there at a, at a feedlot. But nonetheless, um, uh, this goes to a recent discussion I've had with the board, which, was, which I commend the board on as sort of having a look at this, uh, having a look at this, this issue and um, something that's ongoing. But in any case, what I've been briefed to do is, is just outline uh, respiratory disease in feedlots. And um, one of the, we just got to borrow a little bit of American data in this, but one of the things that sort of our, as far as our track record goes is that over time, and this is during the 90s here, so if you have a look at a sort of uh, a time period uh, and, and how the disease incidence goes, you see that death loss due to a whole lot of other causes just stays pretty flat through the decade, and this is continuing on to our current, um, current decade. But BRD as a disease just increases in incidence over time. And this is, this is steadily increasing and certainly not uh, going back, uh, getting lower. Um, what is BRD? It's a, basically a combination of all these factors here uh, of, of stress and viral infections and bacterial infections, but essentially what it comes down to is that uh, uh, stress factors and, and, and uh, problems with the immune system and viral infections and bacterial infections sort of team up to uh, give you uh, respiratory disease and, uh, uh, and basically economic loss. What those economic losses in the feedlot sector, this is some old data from the 90s from uh, uh, MLA, estimating at about $20 per head across all animals, uh, pretty much $40 million per year to the industry. It's probably a conservative estimate. It's probably a lot more than, uh, than that nowadays. And there's some more sort of clinical losses that we're, that we're making that probably aren't included in that. So it's, a, it's our principal disease in, feed, in feedlots. Pretty much the formula is that. It's a, the immune system, stress, viruses and bacteria, ending up with uh, animals that look like this in the feed yard and chests that look like this on post-mortem. And, and currently, our, our most sensitive uh, diagnostic on feedlots, unfortunately, is post-mortem. We, uh, we open uh, anim animals up after death and see these signs here, the pleurisy there all, all over the surface of these lungs and sort of a, a consolidated pneumonia there. This is what we find. Just uh, having a look at that database that uh, we run together with Matt George, then, uh, looking at um, sort of three, uh, for the quarter, first quarter of this year, uh, roughly 370,000 animals and feedlot sizes as low as 2,800 up to one feed yard and go to 45,000 head, but on average about six, 16,000. What are the sort of, uh, where does BOD sit and all that? And these are pools, these are reasons that we pull animals um, out, of the, uh, out of the pen and take them to the hospital for treatment. BRD is, is by far the largest sort of component of all sickness on feed yards. Around about 60% there for the first <coughs> quarter of this year, and that's pretty much the same year in, year out. As far as death loss goes, um, for the first quarter of this year, we've seen the death loss due to these other causes. There's a multitude of other causes there, but some of those are unknown, and that we do a post mortem and we can't find anything. But BRD is still the highest cause of death loss on feed yards, certainly the yards that we go and consult to in any way. What do I, here's another Hereford, that was, that was good of me, but um, what, what do I put that, that one up there for? We just talked about the immune system and, and the, and the uh, stress effects, and those stresses, by the way, were things like um, marketing through sale yards, time off feed and water, long transit distances, mixing the strange cattle um, on arrival, um, and sort of having to get used to new feed, in this case, uh, concentrate in our case. Um, but g generally that mixing and that time off feed and water and that, and that sort of that, that marketing to the feed yard, all of those stress effects are additive and have a detrimental effect on the immune system. But I'm sure many people in the room, and, and I'm looking here at Bruce Gunning, and we've spent some uh, time doing this on weekends and late at night and stuff like that every now and again. We've got little heifers that were presented like this for a cesarean, and we've basically just, and, and I've been, not at your place, Bruce, but I've been at some places where she's gone down, guts open, and uterus off into the mud and we've just dusted it off and patched it together and let it go again and she's um she's kicked on she's been breathing you know like a lot of cesareans out in the open air and stuff like that are fine for cattle um we don't often run into troubles do that to a horse it's dead before the time you've done the last stitch up you know if it's, even if for dogs we do those in a proper theater case scenario yeah, cattle tend, tend to be pretty robust but why is it i just said we do a couple of strict little stress uh, effects like you know, just being transported to a feed yard, going through a sale, going through a sale yard, and having some hours of time and feed and water. Why is it that they're presenting with respiratory disease in, in feed yards, and why is it such a prevalent thing, and why is it why is it such a, a big issue for um, for the producers that we consult to? 
pretty much amounts to um, this Keith de Donda is a, was a master's student at Kansas State Uni and in his thesis he sort of summed it up pretty much in this paragraph here. We, we spent more than 100 years selecting um, beef cattle for genetic lines with greater digestive capacity, big, bigger muscle mass and all, all these things and, and all those collective things have gone together to outstrip the bovine's gaseous exchange capacity and that's a big long unnecessary set of words for just saying we've bred some little lungs. So much so that cattle now have only got 25% of the lung volume per unit body weight compared to all other mammals. So they're getting around with great rumens, great muscle masses, great frames, great sort of digestive capacity. But what we've done is, in, in crude terms, we've pushed the chest down into a little box. And that, that's basically we've bred into them a weakness. And that's not just in Herefords, that's across all cattle. Uh, and um, so essentially what this means is that they've already got a weakened system in their, in their um, respiratory system. And then when we add some stresses to them, that's the place where we hit them. Not like that little heifer getting a caesarean or something like that. She can deal with that every day of the week. But if we just put some stress on cattle and, and, and on their immune system, where they're going to feel it is in their lungs. A bit of an example of that, we look at sort of some of the physiology here. Look at all these mammals here on this scale. Cattle have lungs that are only 12 and a half litres in size when you compare that to a horse of 42 litres. The amount of, of um, basal use of oxygen, I guess, what this is, is this is just maintenance, this is just to get out of bed and just stand up. Um, all these, uh, as far as we go, we use 11% of our lung capacity just to get around, just, just at the moment, you're using 11% of your total lung capacity. But for, for cattle, that's nearly 30%. That's nearly a third of their total lung capacity and their respiratory physiology just to maintain themselves. What does it mean between horses and cattle? Oxygen consumption in a, in a, a similarly sort of a size steer to a horse, they use up to 125,000 mils per minute of oxygen, whereas a horse is only using 12,500. The difference is, is, is massive. And so what, what we've got there is a weakened respiratory system in general. I talked about the viral pathogens. There's, uh, there's, there's viruses that are involved in respiratory disease, and viruses necessarily are the first part of it once the immune system is weakened and and once um, uh, the, uh, the um, respiratory capacity is further compromised. But these viruses here are all implicated in, in respiratory disease and feed gaps. Their names aren't important, um, but you, people might be used to, uh, familiar with the one pesty virus here. But what these viruses basically do is lower the respiratory uh, system's defences and make it uh, le less likely to defend itself against bacteria. It's important to realise that these viruses aren't, don't reside at feedlots, they're on the cattle themselves. So it's a bit like the kindergarten example, where a bunch of kids go to kindy for the first week, come home with snotty noses, and that's pretty much the same thing for a feed yard. The, the, the viruses are carried on the kids, not the kindergarten. It's the same, same in feedlots. <coughs> what do they do? They're spread by aerosols. They're, they're very, uh, there's some, some really interesting work to show how pesky viruses so easily spread at troughs and, uh, and bunks and fence line contact, and that's out in, in paddock situations as well. But uh, the increased likelihood in feed yards of, of these viruses being spread around is simply by the numbers of cattle that find themselves within close contact. Once they infect the respiratory system and, and they sort of uh, reduce the, the ability of, of, this, of these small airways and that to clear bacteria, uh, or alternatively uh, to, to uh, their, their local immune uh, defence against other viruses, then what happens is, in this stylized human uh, diagram here, but bacteria that normally live up the back of the nose and throat now gain access down to the lungs. Now you've got a situation where bacteria are where they shouldn't be, and they multiply rapidly uh, to, to cause disease. IBR is probably the, the, the most significant <coughs> virus that we deal with in the respiratory disease complex, and it sort of can present like this with uh, serous watery discharge and blood coming out the nostrils. You can see this fellow here who's got the, you know, blood out both nostrils and quite a lot of discharge there. Importantly with this fella, he come bounding down a mound and sort of blew a heap of snot at me and turned off and with his tail in the air and galloped around the pen. He's not sick with respiratory disease, he's challenged by IVR at the moment, but his immune system is good enough to sort of hold that off. That's not the case for all cattle. You see about 60% you know, um, of the cattle we pull have got respiratory disease, but this guy here was able to mount a defense to that. Um, and we're gonna talk about control, and Matthew Monk's gonna talk about how you can set this guy up so he doesn't, he might get challenged by viruses in the feed yard, but doesn't get sick with BRD. IVR though, it by itself, if the immune system isn't strong enough to hold it off, can end up with this. This is a windpipe here, which is um, basically uh, is being um, ravaged by IVR, and it kills the lining of the of the windpipe, 
leaving you with these scabs here like this. And, and that by itself, that one virus by itself, if, it's, if there's no immune defence against it at all, can that result in death. Pestivirus, I won't get into that too much, I think, but pestivirus is, got, is, is known as like a cattle aid, sort of, it's generally immunosuppressive. Um, we had a look at um, persistently infected um, pestivirus carriers and feed yards, and here's these two characters here, we're able to identify them by um, ear notches out of the skin. And through this work we found that 0.3% of all cattle hitting a feed yard, three in every thousand, uh, these guys are, are actually PIs. Some of them, these guys look like PIs, you know, the, the runty little things, but some of them didn't look any different. In fact, there's another PI right there. But uh, ultimately, these, these two guys here that started very um, early, uh, the, these, these other two here started later on feed, at, at, um, this is a Calara feedlot, than these two, but you see these two never really grew to any great sort of extent. This PI here though, he, look, he looks like all the others that are closing out normally. What happens with these guys is they discharge billions of virus particles every day, and when they come to the feed yard, they've necessarily got more um, cattle that they can spread pestivirus to, but we found that it takes a lot of these to cause much difference to the pen morbidity. It's not just pestivirus that's an issue. It's, a, it's a, lots of viruses, lots of bacteria, and lots of immune factors that, that will give you respiratory disease. So it, it's, a, it's a factor, but it's not the main factor in, in uh, respiratory <coughs> disease. There are some other pretty simple things that we can measure over time that, sort of, that are directly related to BRD. And this one here, this is, this is some old data here again, sort of thing, but we looked at a feed, feedlot um, over time and just tracked the death loss due to uh, how cattle were marketed to the feedlot. You can see that sale yard sourced cattle typically died at a rate two times the uh, paddock cattle for all that time period, and that's the same as it is today. There's pretty simple things you can measure. The lighter the cattle are in induction and being placed on the feed yard, the more likely they are to be presented for treatment. This is for respiratory disease. The lighter they are at induction, uh, the more likely they are to die. So if you've got sale yard marketed cattle that are quite light, down around sort of two, say 300, 320 kilograms, they've got a higher risk of being presented for respiratory disease in the feed yard and dying. Have a look at some other things, like these are paddock purchases here. The, 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 le the smaller the lot size, when you're getting down, um, there might be paddock purchase cattle, but there's only sort of 10 head per lot, you're starting to sort of increase the death loss at that rate, around about 35 head. Uh, this R squared value over here means that it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's pretty good data and that it's just described, the, it's, it's taken a lot of noise out of this analysis. This is the, what we're looking at here is just these things, purchase lot size and death loss. And as they get smaller and smaller lot sizes, <laughs> and they become more like sale yard cattle. For sale yard purchases, it doesn't really change things. The lot sizes can be whatever. The fact that they've come through a sale yard is, is more, it is, it's got more to do with them uh, being more likely to die than the actual lot size out of a sale yard. And this was a, a couple of years ago at uh, Inverella presented to the sale yard conference some of this data and this went down like a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Some chicken wire. <laughs> so, um, so as far as the uh, yearly comparison, just have a look. Is it, is, does this hold true? It absolutely does. This is some um, stuff here looking through uh, June to June 2004, 2005. We found that um, you know, mortality in the, in the uh, paddock um, source cattle was running here about 1.9%, but in the sale yard cattle was 2.64. This was a trade yard. We had a lot, lot of little cattle going into sort of high turnover yard, we're turning cattle out very, very quickly, 60, 70 day feeding programs. You see that the, the vendor, that we tracked all this by pick numbers and that, it was a big, a big undertaking to track all these tail tags. But pretty much the, the difference here in these sale yard and paddock um, groups were, same number of cattle, 32,000 head here, 32,000 head there, was the high number of vendors. There's a heap of mixing going on here. We're pulling cattle from all different sources. And, and the mortalities played out as you'd expect. Um, you know, just nearly, nearly there's a difference here of 1.45% in, in mortality. Tony, well, what's, sorry, what yeah, is the DOF? Oh, sorry, days on feed. Sorry, good, good question. Uh, when, they, when they presented, uh, on average, the, the death loss, uh, they were 17 days on feed for these that presented in 20 days here. That's pretty quick. Pretty quick, yeah. yeah. This, this was a high, this was a particularly nasty period too. The reason I've got data from here was because we're pulling our hair out with all the BID that was going on. Through 2004, 2005 was a hot year. Uh, some of the, the economics, um, I don't want to label on this for too long, but 
more profit to be made in the paddock, and, and actually Matt, Matt's going to deal with this really well, so um, I, I won't sort of label that too much. Just needless to say that um, there is a significant economic loss in VRD. So how do we go about controlling it and sort of managing it and, and, and uh, looking after it on feed yards? The, the reality is our, our diagnostics on feed yards is this. People go out on horses every day, ride into pens, pull out the sick cattle and treat them and hopefully in a timely enough manner that we save as many as possible. But that is the reality of what um, our feedlot diagnostics are. People train to go out and look for disease and, and, uh, and intervene at a timely. This is Christmas time here, you can't get away from it, it's every day of the year. Wouldn't be um, unusual to you guys. In the vet clinic and our horse, our horse practice uh, down at Creedice, so we've got some other toys that we can use, which makes our life a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. Using endoscopy or using ultrasound on the chest and sort of rebreathing bags and stuff like that. We don't have that uh, ability on feed yards. You can get even crazier. You can sort of use some of these sort of more advanced diagnostics. And this is up in Peter Best practice in Tamworth, I think, and Peter loves this sort of stuff. <laughs> and um, you know, you, this is this is a CAT scan for for a chest here of this little guy. Brady graphs, stuff like that. We've got all these diagnostics that we can use in the vet clinic and in hospitals, but feedlot staff don't have that uh, available to them. They, they don't have that range of diagnostics. What they've got to be good at is have good skills at reading cattle behaviour and detecting abnormalities. They need to be able to sort of see the body language in cattle that are, are, are affected by disease. And, um, and the, 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 you know, being able to read that body language and, and demeanour is essential. Good acclimators are excellent pen riders. Acclimators, acclimation, it's a whole new topic sort of thing and, and I, potentially Matt's going to touch on that as well. Um, but essentially this is a, a methodology of handling cattle such that we reduce stress and then we actually um, facilitate good adaptation to the feed yard. But if people are good at that, they're good at reading cattle behaviour and they're good at reading the, the signs when they're first occurring and that they make excellent pen riders. And you couple that with experience and good stock skills which is increasingly less and less nowadays as people go to mines and stuff like that. Um, we have less of the sort of true stockies that we used to have, but in any case, um, couple all of this uh, with, with uh, daily sort of surveillance, then that's your best, best chance of detecting disease. So we get the guys to go out into pens and to, and to look for this, and uh, you'll note that I've put non-Hereford sick cattle in this, in this slide, so I've sort of half done my bit. But Here's the sort of, these cattle are uh, going through various stages of uh, the depression and the, uh, and the, uh, the sort of the, I, I guess the uh, listless body language of uh, cattle affecting the BRD. This guy's in God's waiting room, so he's just about done. <laughs> this guy's pretty crook, but not as crook as him, and this guy here is just starting to go off. And, uh, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Just starting to be a little bit sort of out of sorts. This fella here, you can pretty much tell you know, um, from, from a long way away that he's crook and that guy there is, there is not much hope. Sorry, I need to turn the um, volume down. Sorry, do you want that? Yep. Possible. So I just want to show you a training video here that we use for our pen riders. Um, and uh, this one um, is, uh, so we've got new pen riders that will sort of um, teach them sort of how to pick BRD and um, how, to pick it, how to pick it in pens and that, and we get them to go through and... Uh, oh, anyway, the sound's going to come through, sorry. But in any case, so this is sort of like pen rider can, and um, all we want the pen riders to do is be able to sort of pick the, all, all the aspects of uh, cattle being affected with BRD, and there's lots of things. There's um, cattle are, are prey animals, uh, uh, that's, that's their, that's their uh, innate nature. So if they are sick, one of the first things I want to do is try to hide, try to sort of uh, disguise the fact that they are cruel. Um, and uh, the body language that they take on is one of being listless, depressed, lethargic, sort of out of sorts. And um, I apologise again that I'm at a Hereford conference and I'm going to pick on a Hereford here, but in any case, what we want our pen to do is to be able to pick this guy right here. The reason this is a training video is because he was amongst the bunch of blacks, so if someone really can't get it, we just say, well, look at the red fella and just, you know, look what he's doing, and those are the signs that we want you to, to look for when you're out in pens. You'll notice with this guy here, he's got a low head carriage, everything in his head is heavy. His pole's heavy, his ears are heavy, his eyelids are heavy, everything's heavy. And you might have just seen in that last frame there just before, when he, was, he lined himself up with his mate there between me and him, uh, put his mate between me and him. He's just trying to hide behind that guy's head. 
He's pretty much out by himself now. He's got a he nose on one of him. You'll see he's got some foot drag in his right hind foot here as he, go, as he goes to take off. Now he's adopting the classic posture of BRD. You see all the cattle around him that are bright, alert, responsive, heads and, and ears are up. But this guy, all he wants to do is just get away from me and just sort of try to be out of, out of sight. Uh, and, and all of his um, body language is pretty heavy and, and listless. This guy is pretty, he's moderately affected with BRD. We really needed to pull him 48 hours ago um, to get better treatment success. As a little bit of um, sort of uh, as, as way of demonstration, this is also a, a training video on quiet pen riding techniques. If you sort of move around the pen quietly and don't sort of put a lot of adrenaline in cattle, a lot of fizz in cattle, you'll get to see these signs pretty sensitively. What I'm about to do in a second is, is put some adrenaline into this steer. So I've got camera in one hand and I've got one of those um, fluorescent vests you'll have to wear at feedlots now. I'm waving it to me and, um, and just about to fall off. So, so, um, so that was the end of the video. But you can see that he, he took off there and if you had it happened on him at that point, who would have known he was crook? And all those three minutes before, you could see that he was quite a crook steer. But if you ride pens like a cowboy, or you know, sort of, you know, with a, with a fog on, sort of thing, then that's what happens. That they, 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 um, he is a prey animal after all. If you get enough adrenaline in him, he'll say, "Well, there's no way on sick. Don't come after me." And you miss those cattle. Talking of missing cattle in our database, what we like to do is to sort of pull together from that 370 odd thousand heads, sort of thing it was for the first quarter is look at all the cattle that have died of BRD within naught to three days of being pulled. Now naught days means we might find him dead in the pen. Now that's unfortunate. We find a dead steer in the pen and we crack him open and the post-mortem pictures, um, you know, the, the pictures from the post-mortem there reveal that he had BRD. He falls into this category, but also category <coughs> cattle that we've pulled, say three days ago, that have died of BRD too. It's too soon. Like, you know, if, they're if they're dying that quickly, we're not picking up those clinical signs quick enough. Thing. Potentially by riding a pen like a madman, like I did in that last little bit there, and you, you miss that fellow tearing off across the pen, um, and then after, once you've left the pen, he goes back to just having his head down. Well, they are all in this in this group here. So pretty much this this here is a frequency histogram of what would happen if we just didn't do anything. We didn't ride the pens, and we just let them go in the pen and die. Here's the days on feed that cattle die at, and you can see here that there's a big concentration of around about sort of 13, 14 days on feed up to about 45 days on feed. So in their first, so the first two weeks, they sort of get used to the feed gate, you get a couple there that are sort of dying of BRD, but the big bulk of them are here are between 14 and, and, and 40 days on feed. So this, this happens across our, all the feedlots, whether they're trade yards, bullet yards, um, whether they're Brahmins, whether they're British cattle, whether they're Euros, whether they're south or in the north, wherever they are, here's the days on feed that that, that happens. When we break it up into bullocks and trade cattle, here's like your woolies and coals and stuff like that. These lighter weight cattle, they die at a higher rate and they happen quicker. So they're coming in this, you've got a higher sort of peak here at 10 days and it sort of trails off very quickly after 35. Bullocks are a little bit more spread out. Things. So, so that's the sort of, and then you can see by around about 60 days on feed, it all starts to plane off and cattle now are actually through their BRD period, their, their main um, respiratory period. We had a, just looking at that first quarter stuff too from our database, pulling all the feedlots together. You can see that that maintains itself all, all, pretty much all the time. You've got your biggest bulk there between um, 14 and 40 days. Still got cattle out to 60 days though, and, and the biggest mistake that pen riders can make is in pens that are 40 to 60 days, they think, oh, well, it's all over, sort of thing, and then just sort of be a bit careless of the way they ride the pens. This is what's actually happening at the moment across all feed yards, is, is that all the ones that we consult them to, um, is that. Here's where all the pulls are coming out at, and you can see that this uh, red line here is higher than that green line, meaning that now that we're in this sort of this autumn period, the pulls are going up. This is this is what you see sort of year on year, is uh, during sort of February, March, April, BRD pulls go up compared to the winter months. Uh, February, March, April, May here again, up they go again. And there's autumn effects in uh, in feed yards, and we think it's got to do with the fact there's a lot of variation in temperature and humidity during the day, cool nights, um, warm afternoons, the humidity goes with it as well. But there are also other factors um, that you have in these periods here. Historically, cattle have become a lot more available during the autumn months and feed, especially trade yards, have filled up quickly. And they've sort of cattle become a bit cheaper and they've sort of hit the yard all at once. And you get all of those stress effects sort of concentrating. But there are weather effects in here too, for sure. Cattle that come to the hospital that are treated for BRD, the rectal temperatures that we've taken here, we see that the, the higher the rectal temperature gets, 
the higher the uh, likelihood of, um, oh, this is dead. So the higher the likelihood they are of dying. So there's a couple of things that we can use. This isn't out in the pen. You need to pull this gear to the hospital to take the temperature to, to, to figure this out. But in any case, there are a couple of little tools we can use to sort of confirm that cattle have got BRD. So for our pen riders, we like to sort of equip them with all this so that they're very good out in pens and they're making sure they're not missing them. A lot of that stuff there doesn't really matter, but, um, but what we hope that they can do is if they know the days on feed at the highest risk is, they know the clinical signs to look for, they know that we're in autumn, for instance, and that there's a higher chance of cattle getting crook, then we sort of equip them with the tools to go out there and, and, and get a good job done. There's a couple of other things that we're mucking around with. Electronic stethoscope that we're um, sort of using in a couple of yards. It generates, da it generates data like this. We're wanting to sort of see if we can uh, generate the, 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 and this pretty much just put the stethoscope on the steers in the hospital. Within, within six seconds, it's come over to the computer where you're at and it generates waveforms and sonograms like this. We want to be able to sort of use this stuff and see if we can actually describe what's going on in the chest. And again, Keith the Donder that did all this work is uh, looked here at um, when he took a score with a, a stethoscope of the steers in the hospital and then at, at slaughter, um, were their uh, lung scores there with the lung abscesses and stuff like that. And sure enough, the higher the score he had um, at the hospital, uh, translated to a, a, a higher uh, risk of having lung scores in, in the uh, abdominal. Having a look at his lung auscultation scores here again, the risk of death, again the same thing. The higher the score, meaning that the worse the chest sounded on the stethoscope when uh, cattle came to the hospital, the more likely they were of dying. And um, so, you know, this is, this is infant technology, it's not quite there yet, but what we hope one day is that, like, you know, steers come into the hospital, you can just put this thing on the chest and the computer tells you, yep, he's a crook one, and, 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 and in addition to that, how crook he is. So for treatment programs, the key to treatment success revolves around early detection and treatment. It's as good as we can do it. We've got, we've got hopefully our pen riders are equipped really well, that they, can, they know what they're looking for, and they're very sensitive about what they pull out of the pens to treat. And they get them on time, but what, so that early detection and treatment is essential. But essentially, it amounts to how do we treat BRD? We treat it with an antibiotic. You need an effective one, and I won't go through all the antibiotics and things. But there are effective ones, and there's ones that aren't so effective for respiratory disease. You've got to get all this right, as as you guys know. You've got to get vaccines and, and treatments right on farm as well. But good hospital management and treatment plan is essential, and medications that suit the disease risk. We use more expensive antibiotics on the yards that have got higher risk. Those yards that have got higher risk are the ones that are higher populated, We've got lighter weight cattle, got more trade cattle, more sale yard source cattle. We use the more expensive antibiotics there. I'm not a proponent of Mycotil or Olenko sort of thing, it's just a picture of an antibiotic that I had to put in this uh, slide. Um, hospital management is essential, and the, the one thing that just you can't get away from is cattle comfort. If stress brought about this disease condition, then we need to sort of de-stress them in the hospital so they can, so they can recover. We use acclimation techniques in here as well, and again, I'll, I'll leave that, that to Matt to think, that's another topic. But nutritional support, usually in our hospitals, we like to give them free choice. So they can have ration, they can have hay, they can have, in some yards we've used Enapro as well. Uh, we want these cattle to have all the um, recipes to uh, success for uh, their recovery. Things. So and the other thing is that they need to be in lightly um, populated pens too. They've just come from more higher intensity pen, home pen, we need to make this environment conducive to recovery. But it's important to assess how you're going too. Not just the visual, but your hospital data and your autopsy data, just make sure that your hospital program is actually working. Uh, this is something that I borrowed from um, Alenko, so it's, um, it's pretty much just to sort of uh, demonstrate a point that here's all the antibiotics that have been uh, produced through the, all those years down there, and uh, the mortality of cattle, BRD mortality, is in the column sort of thing that have progressed over time. You know that first graph I showed, that mortality due to BRD has just increased, just, just um, quietly, but it's gone up and up and up over time. Um, so all those antibiotics have been developed. The new ones are um, just about, you know, in that 10-year, in that, um, 15-year period there, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've developed more than half a dozen new antibiotics. In that time, we're developing those antibiotics, the BRD mortality rates have increased by you know, on, on roughly 1.69% over that time. So it's about 0.2% every 10 years. So by, if we continue along that, <coughs> along that line, if we just have BRD mortality go up 0.2% every 10 years in the face of developing these new antibiotics, pretty much by the year 69, 90, all the cattle will be dead. 
<laughs> it's, a bit of, it's a bit of fun with this sort of having with this sort of thing, but the point that I was trying to make was that in the face of new antibiotics, we haven't really gotten anywhere. We've still got this increase going on. And I think it goes back to some of those physiological effects that we were talking about. And here's the, here's the issue with using antibiotics in this, in this uh, and especially in our more recent um, uh, decade, is that there's a lot more consumer scrutiny and a lot more regulatory scrutiny on, on how we use antibiotics in uh, food producing animals, despite the fact that uh, issues of, you know, of human drug resistance and that are wholly and principally, and I've just come from a, a country where I could walk into a pharmacy and buy uh, uh, amoxicillin clavulanic acid over the counter with no prescription. Um, it, it pretty much tells you where the issue is from human, um, human drug resistance, but nonetheless, there's a lot of scrutiny on us, and, and uh, when you've got um, you know, um, you've got commercial enterprises and that, like Chipotle here, who are um, sort of advocating that they use antibiotics in their beef. It's something that we all have to be aware of. Vaccines, here's a practical way of trying to deal with BRD. And, um, and, and again, I, I think Matt's going to uh, um, pretty much outline the, the sundown program. It's pretty much the, the pinnacle of what you should aim for if you're trying to uh, vaccinate cattle in an environment where you're going to get the most effective response. Here's some um, stuff. If we haven't got cattle that are being pre-vaccinated in paddocks pre-feedlot though, here's some point of induction vaccinations that we can use. And that IBR virus where I showed you the, the windpipe that was all torn to shreds. Here's application of that. It's an intranasal up the nose sort of thing as cattle come through the induction crush. And you get immunity from this pretty quickly. It comes in these little uh, frozen vials here. And the most recent one introduced this year is an injectable here for, it's a bacterial vaccine. Um, that's a one shot though. We don't need the two shots sort of thing, you know, like we do in other vaccines. Like these guys, these, these vaccines here all require two shots to get an effective response, pretty much like the five and ones. Um, and uh, this, these have been advocated as sort of re-vaccination therapy in feed yards where they get their first shot of induction, they get another shot in the feeding period. We've had some experience with this, but we haven't been able to sort of demonstrate that that's been effective at all, to be honest. Uh, not nearly as effective as, as vaccinating cattle in the paddock pre feed lot. Just a quick look at um, sort of the feeder guard program where they had an analysis done there sort of um, uh, back a couple of years ago so then, and then the morbidity rates of uh, cattle, in, uh, so if you increase the amount of pre-vaccinated cattle in the pen, the lower the morbidity rates, but the lower the morbidity rates of cattle not even vaccinated in that program. So the more vaccinated cattle you had in the pen, the less overall disease um, incidents you had in that pen, even in the non-vaccinated cattle. It just goes to show that if their immune systems are are competent and not spewing out those viruses and that to the, uh, to, the, to the other susceptible cattle. And the same thing happened with BOD mortality as well. The feeder program is now being pulled. Feedlot site preconditioning, this is where we've looked at sort of um, doing our own sort of integrated program on, on a, um, a client that we deal with and has got the capacity to sort of background cattle at the feedlot and uh, having a look at this. So the, cattle, the Woolies cattle have just gone straight into the feed yard. We've had BOD morbidities of up to 18% and death loss of about 0.47%. But when we backgrounded those same Woolies cattle, bought them just a little bit lighter, backgrounded them for four, four, around about four weeks here in this program, under these two vaccination programs here. When those cattle have gone through the yard, they've had significantly less morbidity than the non-backgrounded cattle and significantly less uh, mortality. Like I said, I won't labor on that too much because uh, Matt's going to deal with that. So, what, well, I guess what it all comes down to is risk assessment, is, uh, is knowing what we're going to get when cattle hit the feed yard and how to sort of manage it. Um, and, and it's not just on what drugs we're going to use and what vaccines we're going to use and that, but we can be a little bit smarter about how we make pens, make pens up. For instance, if we had cellular cattle that were lightweight, that were multi-sourced, it would probably be a good idea to, uh, as you just saw with a, with a feeder guard example there, is if you had uh, pen space left over that had vaccinated animals in it, to try to dilute the risk is maybe head them that way. Or alternatively, not try to remix them with other cattle that come through the same marketing program. Try to sort of dilute the risk out. And this was an, a, an attempt we made back in 2005 to sort of set up a risk assessment calculator. And um, I, I, the reason I put it here is because we've, um, we've moved on from this. There's some things here that we just didn't know at the time. We knew that some of these entry rates held higher risks. We thought that heifers had a higher risk than steers when this has, come, this has turned out in, in later data to actually be not so not actually true. We can have this actually a little bit more equivalent than that. But I'm sorry guys, here, here we go. We've had Herefords up here as the sort of the highest sort of disease risk at the time. 
Um, there's some work that's happening, and I'll, I'll talk about the BID initiative in a, in a second. This was all based on anecdotal data. We didn't have the data at that point. We just said, all right, well, we reckon. So then we knew about this stuff. We, re we knew about sale yards and paddock source cattle and background of cattle. The reason that we broke this up into regions that we found later on, the cattle coming from these regions, these Tasmania, sale yard, and, and, uh, sorry, Tasmania, South Australia and Victoria, when we looked at this particular feedlot and had a look at those regions, we found out that some of the lot sizes were three head. There were some people in Victoria that were selling three head of cattle to a, um, to a sale yard. It was, and, and whereas we got to Queensland, it was numbers more like 20 and 30 and 50 head. So we had these really small lot sizes going through here. We had, it was amazing how many, uh, in one pen, the, the record was one pen of 350 cattle had 80 sources in it. There were 80 different sort of vendors in the one pen. Um, Co-mingling coefficient, so if we had enough vendors here, we had a higher risk. Um, so th this was an attempt to look at this so that we could do a couple of things, try to dilute the risk out when we made up pens, but also said to pen riders, Listen, these cattle, have, all the plants are lined up, this is going to be a wreck. You really need to be looking hard at this pen from seven days on feed. Uh, don't worry about that one. Alrighty, so this is, this is a, I, I don't need to have the Australian equivalent. 2010, there's, um, you know, this, this is interesting. In 2010, this is the, the US uh, cattle industry. The amount, the highest number of um, beef producers have one to 49 head, 500 head head plus, you're, you're a very, relatively small amount. So these small uh, vendor numbers, the, sorry, these small lot sizes are, are a global sort of phenomenon, sort of thing. and I was really surprised by this data here. The National BID Initiative, this was a, a, a big project that's, that's finished now, and actually the data's been collated and being reported, but this was looking at all the possible management factors that could go to, for, for cattle and BID on feed yards. This went right back to the producers. This was like, you know, they, the questionnaires went out to say the likes of Bruce and yourself. Anyone, was anyone involved in this? Did anyone get a national BRD initiative um, questionnaire supplying, say, JBS yards? That's interesting. Well, that's, and, and I was talking with John um, McHugh just before we started here. Some of this information is, is, is the stuff that we're looking for, and, and I'm, I'm surprised that no one in the Hereford Society got a questionnaire, so it's something we've got to look at. But this was asking how do you wean your cattle, how do you sort of manage your cattle, how do you grow your steers, what do they, what do they grow on, who do you sell your cattle to. All, all of those sort of pre-feedlot factors, we took bloods from, and nasal swabs and that on, on the feed yard to sort of find out that mix of viruses and bacteria, um, followed them all the way through to the um, uh, abattoir, followed their lung lesions, looked at weather data, dust data and the whole lot. All this is going together as one big epidemiological project here to uh, tell us what those risk factors are for BRD. And I did have this information, but I've been instructed by MLA not to, I think they're going to present to the society later on in the year. But the question of where Hereford sit in that, that, that question is in there, but I'm not obligated to say just yet, which is a real pain. But in any case, um, uh, they're going to present to you guys later on. So we are starting to build, a the point is, we're starting to build a database of what these factors are that um, can lead to higher risk for, of BRD in, in feed yards. And what, there's sort of a, just getting to the end here now, the other approaches to take. Here's a multi-million dollar project. Um, is Dave Johnston in the room? Was no, he was here yesterday. Dave Johnston yesterday? Yeah, Dave Johnston and, and I have been looking at this. Yeah. And this is a multi-million dollar project, a, a government assisted project in the States, looking at the genomics of respiratory disease. It's called the Inter Integrated Program for Reducing Bone and Respiratory Disease Complex in Beef and Dairy Cattle, because uh, obviously the dairy cattle, the little calf rearing hutches are an issue over here as well. This is using ge um, genomics and all of that epidemiological data we just talked about then for the National BRD Initiative to get this question sorted out. They are, um, and, and the comment they make here at the start is pretty much pretty, pretty, pretty familiar, that disease of the respiratory system are a major cause of death loss. Uh, sadly, this is true today as it was 30 years ago, despite the development of new and improved vaccines, new broad spectrum antibiotics and the like. And that, um, as, been, as I say, it's been extensively stated since the 1800s and yet it remains prevalent. And uh, interestingly, 1.4% of, of US feedlot cattle perish before reaching harvest weight. That's the same here. We, were, we operate around about 1%. So they're saying here that you know, we're not winning this battle, so we need to develop new approaches. And their approaches are around genomics, which is pretty much the, as David probably talked to you yesterday, is, it, is pretty much the study of how uh, different genes interact to give you um, certain uh, traits. 
and um, long-term goal is to reduce the incidence of BRD uh, with these novel genetic approaches and how they want to do it. Uh, and it's obviously it's very attractive to look at uh, resistance to disease um, uh, for the reasons of, you know, we talked about sort of drugs as well. Drugs are a non-permanent non -permanent solution and also we've got community and other sort of um, uh, scrutiny on the use of drugs nowadays that so we have to look at these other approaches. What they're going to do is get these large training discovery populations with BRD and use these SMP genotypes. SMPs, um, what's a single nucleotide polymorphism? Basically, it's describing how these, these uh, uh, they've got uh, markers and they've got uh, way, ways of detecting uh, combinations of, of genes and, and, and what they uh, translate to. And they use that to estimate every chromosome fragment contributing to BRD susceptibility. This is quite an ambitious um, project. They've got. I, I, that's, they, the, I think the key word here is estimate the value of every chromosome fragment. We know the bovine genome, but we don't know how all these things interact. And so this is, uh, this is going to be quite a project, and, and the, the amount of millions of dollars involved in this one is immense. And uh, this was one aspect we were looking at as far as the Hereford Society goes, is having a look at this question. But you know, what I say is let the Yanks do it, because uh, this, they've got the means and they've got the... Uh, uh, ability to look at this, but they'll still only be able to estimate. A lot of this genomic sort of approach here is just going to have to evolve over time, and it's really a long-term solution. Uh, they, what they want to be able to do, though, is the results of training can then be used to predict the genetic merit of new animals. Not conduct. So basically, they want to build a model and then be able to use it. Um, and papers are coming out nowadays talking about this stuff. The Journal of Animal Science, 2010, is being able to sort of use biomarkers and that that they can get in the, in the blood to sort of track these traits. Now we're just not sensitive enough yet though. So it's very much a, a long-term goal looking at how, how do we sort of reduce um, BRD susceptibility. And, and I guess uh, what I wanted to finish up with was in some of the feed yards I go to, we see a lot of Herefords in a lot of places. If anyone's familiar with um, Mount Riddy, it's, a, it's a, a supplier that time, you know, month in, month out, year in, year out, they come to the feed yard and they don't have the same problems that we see with other, probably sale yard source, um, British cattle That's and the like. Read the thing. And, um, mm. you know, they're, 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 and, and I guess what I'm, what I'm sort of suggesting is those genomics, those sort of high lofty sort of genomics ways of approaching BRD susceptibility is what we need to pursue, absolutely. But in the short the medium term options, we need to uh, pursue some of these more phenotypic variables that are going on, such as preconditioning, such as the sort of the, and, and it was interesting, I just thought, oh, back it, I'll have a look online, and sure enough, the Mount Rennick had been involved through some territory government thing with a herd health performance um, assessment during the 90s sort of thing. Uh, I don't know who Jocelyn Coventry is, but some of these sort of pre-feedlot factors have sort of been teased out as to what makes this a success, what, what, what's going on there, and, and Matt's going to talk about some of that as well. Uh, sort of allowing these guys to come to a feed yard and be less susceptible to BRD. Alright? Have I hit time? Or have I done well. Over? Done very well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.